Hello, I am Yolanda Tonette Sanders. I am honored to moderate this Ohioana panel um, called The Art of the Short Story. With me, I have five amazing authors. We have Nancy Christie, Elliot Parker, Nathan Elias, Don Tasson, and Gwen Goodkin. So thank you all for joining. Welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Nice I'm happy to be here. Oh, uh, happy that you are here. So we're not going to spend um, a whole bunch of time with all the niceties. We're just going to get right to the point. So tell us your stories. How did you get into writing short stories? And then feel free to tell us a little bit about your featured story for Ohioana. We'll start with Nancy. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, in terms of writing fiction, honestly, I, I think it came because when I was a child, lo those many decades ago, um, you didn't watch that much TV way back then. So you were always told, go outside and play, okay? And because I lived in an area where there was still a lot of woods and everything, you did a lot of imagination play. Let's pretend, okay? So writing fiction was a real natural outgrowth um, from making up stories. You know, first you made them up verbally, then you started writing them down. And it just stuck with me. It's not like I said, oh, I think I'm going to, you know, focus on writing fiction, focus on writing short stories. It was just a very natural thing. So, um, that's that's really where it came from. I mean, it 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 doesn't take much, you know. It's it's like that old saying: "Be careful, you'll end up in a story of mine." I, I mean, honestly, that's where that's how a lot of them come about. You know, you eavesdrop, which is rude, or you <laughs> or you spy on people, which is rude. Um, but something about what they're saying, about their mannerisms, and then you start going into you know, what if you play that? What if? What if they were this, that, or the other? And that's really where it came from. Um, my latest collection, Peripheral Visions and Other Stories. This is my second short story collection. And um, it came about because I still had so many more stories sitting on my computer hard drive, some of which have been published individually that um, I reached out to my publisher and said, hey, let's, let's do another one. And so it sort of centers around a theme, but they are, you know, they are different. They are, they're, they're not linked stories They're individual stories, but they do kind of have a common theme. So that, that's my story in a nutshell. All right, thank you. So Elliot, what about you? Well, um, I, I started writing short stories when I was just sort of uh, experimenting with writing. Um, I was a journalism major as an undergrad uh, at Marsh University in West Virginia, and I had a good friend named Zach who was a creative writing major, and he forever was poking and goading at me to start writing creatively. And uh, long story short, I joined a creative writing club during my uh, senior year. One of the um, agreements we made in this creative writing club was we would send our work out to be published. And this was in the days before submittable. This is in the days when you had to uh, you self address stamped envelopes and get the big, the big uh, manila envelopes, go to the post office and all of that. Um, so I sent one of my stories uh, uh, off. It was a, it was a ghost story and it ended up getting published in a literary journal called uh, spec, which is produced, I believe still produced by Mary Washington college in Virginia. So it was the first time that I ever had someone publish something that I had written creatively. And so I started writing uh, short stories really ever since then. And, and those were the first works I ever got published was, was short stories. Um, I've since transitioned to writing, to writing novels and to writing mystery and thriller novels, but I still love going back to the short story form. And I, I find that it's a great way to keep sort of my creative juices flowing, but it also helps me if I'm at a point in my a novel that I'm working on where I've kind of uh, written my character into a corner or I've, I've reached a mental roadblock and I don't really know where to go next. Stepping away from that and going to short stories uh, is something that uh, is a tremendous help to me. And my uh, latest collection of stories, this is a copy of the cover, it's called Snapshots. Um, these are uh, 11 stories that are set in West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky, which are all states where I've either lived uh, 
uh, bo born and raised or gone to school in. So I have familiarity with all three of those states. And basically, um, and it's a multi-genre collection of stories. So there's some romance, there is some mystery and thriller, there is some uh, family drama, there's some speculative fiction in there. There's a wide variety of different stories there. But basically what goes on in that collection is that um, it, each of the characters, each of the main characters in those stories are placed in situations where their past behaviors will be changed uh, in a moment. Uh, almost like a snapshot picture, sort of freezing in time, kind of who they are and, and how they got there. And they have to make a decision. Do they continue going on uh, down the path uh, that they've been on, or are they going to change their behavior and change the way that they interact and relate with other people? Um, and so uh, the idea of, of snapshots where I got that title from was a quote that Eudora Welty had, uh, who's one of my favorite uh, 20th century writers, and she wrote, a good snapshot keeps a moment from going away. And so uh, I have an actual story in the collection called Snapshots. Uh, but when I was thinking about coming up with a theme and coming up with uh, something that linked all these stories together, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about, you know, uh, each one of these characters kind of has a snapshot moment where where they are and what they're into is sort of frozen like a picture. And then they've got to decide, am I going to keep going that way or am I going to change? And, and sometimes they go the same way they uh, have been and sometimes they change. And sometimes it works out well for them and sometimes it doesn't. So... It's a lot of fun. I love short story. I like the challenge of short stories. I like the challenge of, of, of trying to condense uh, an interesting story that's going to engage the reader in 10,000 words or less, which is very different than, than writing a novel when you sometimes have, you know, 60, 70, 80,000 words to work with. So it, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. And uh, it was a lot of fun putting these, this collection together. I started working on this collection in 2011. So it took me almost nine years to get them all uh Cause sort of coalesced into a collection. Some of them have been published individually in literary journals and some of them were, were new stories. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Nathan, your turn. Yes, I'm Nathan Elias, the author of The Reincarnations, which was published by Montag Press in October of 2020. And I really started storytelling when I was 14. I was really obsessed with films and filmmaking and it's probably just um, a product of growing up in front of the TV. I'm from Toledo, Ohio, and it's a great town and I'm really proud to be from there, but there just wasn't a lot to do. And I just became so obsessed with just how do I create and tell stories? And that was really my trajectory for a long time. Um, I remember the first you know, time I made a film with, I forced my friends to act in this samurai screenplay I wrote. We were 15 out in these, you know, backwoods parks uh, filming these scenes. And I was just, it even came at the cost of my grades sometimes in school. I went to a trade school um, for technology, which isn't really my strong suit. And I was so excited to go be in a venue like college or university where I could be around like-minded people. Um, the University of Toledo had a film program and I ended up double majoring in film and creative writing. And it was that during that time when I started to study short fiction and creative writing and poetry that I started to realize, okay, well maybe there's another avenue to tell stories other than filmmaking. And eventually in 2012, I left Toledo for Los Angeles where I continued filmmaking and acting and things like that. But a lot of, a lot of that work encapsulates um, other people. You have to have other actors, producers, lighting technicians, sound techn technicians. There's so much technology that goes into it. And it became a roadblock for me as a storyteller. And it was really around 2016 really 2015 when I, I started to say, let me just write without worrying about trying to produce something for the screen. Let me just mm -hmm. focus on prose instead of screenwriting. And I really fell in love with that. And I just lost myself in, uh, in storytelling. So I, I remember going to the Los Angeles library and I just checked out as many books as they would let me. Um, I just checked out classic story collections I checked out the contemporary stuff. I started to learn what paths different fiction writers would take as story writers and how that would 
transition into writing novels. And in 2016, I went to get my MFA in creative writing at Antioch University, Los Angeles. And I focused on fiction and I just put everything else behind me just because I knew that this was really my passion. So a lot of that filmmaking and acting and things like that taught me about story arc, story structure, character development, character wants and needs and desires. And I just applied all that to prose. And since then, I just love books. Um, I don't even really watch television or films that much anymore. I'm just obsessed with the written word. And um, my future right now is Montag Press is publishing my novel, my debut novel. It's called Coil Quake Rift. And that should be out, I think, in late summer of 2021. And that's my history as a short story writer in a nutshell. All right, thank you. Don. Well, my name is Don Tassone and uh, I'm originally from Dayton, Ohio and was born there and we moved, <clears throat> excuse me, to the Cincinnati area when I was a kid. And I don't honestly remember writing that much as a kid. I remember reading a lot. And I think it was reading as I, as I think back on it that really turned me on to writing. I found myself uh, moved by great writing, um, whether it was in books uh, or magazines or on television. A couple of people have mentioned television. I was a kid growing up in the television age, I suppose. And um, I think it was through that that I kind of fell in love with the written word. Uh, and I did more and more writing as I was uh, growing up through high school, for example. Ended up becoming a, an English major uh, in college, although I was a communication major before that, journalism major. I did some news writing uh, over the course of the summers uh, during college and in college, and uh, ultimately ended up uh, as an English major graduating and, um, and uh, being, uh, being hired by Procter & Gamble, uh, based here in Cincinnati, which is where I spent my career, and I spent that career in public relations. So I have a business background, maybe, maybe unlike others uh, on the uh, panel, but uh, that's where I spent uh, 31 years and um, retired after that. Uh, not knowing exactly what I wanted to do, but writing was always kind of um, in the back of my mind, creative writing that is. And I hadn't done a lot of creative writing uh, since I was an English major in college. I'd done a lot of writing, uh, a lot of uh, business writing, a lot of technical writing. I wrote a thousand, uh, maybe a million news releases, for example. Uh, but um, when, I, when I left P&G and when I retired and thought about um, trying my hand at writing, I wrote a couple of short stories uh, to get started. I really had in mind writing a novel, but I wrote a couple of short stories uh, thinking it would be a breeze. And uh, I shared them with a couple of friends and who would give me honest feedback, but I wasn't sure they would give me that honest of feedback. Um, it, they basically said, this is crap. And uh, one person said, this looks like a memo. And, uh, and I realized that uh, all of my years of business writing, which really had made me a terribly efficient writer and a very effective writer in that environment, I had kind of killed my creativity and that I needed some training. So I went back to the basics. I, I, uh, I signed on for a one week uh, workshop in a place called New Harmony, Indiana, which is a little town outside of Evansville. And I hold up there with a bunch of 20 somethings for a week. And uh, all of these kids, by the way, could write, write rings around me. And uh, I learned a lot. It was a re-immersion for me and uh, kind of the basics of, uh, of good writing, the stuff that we all do through our short story writing uh, developing a plot, developing characters, developing subplots if we're so lucky, um, developing conflict and resolution, all of these basic things that I really had intended to for all those years while I was at PNG, I had to come back to and kind of relearn, if you will. It was terrific. Uh, and coming out of that, then I began writing stories, uh, fiction and nonfiction. I spent the better part of that summer writing just one story. It was a nonfiction piece, which I ultimately got uh, accepted uh, by a publication called Red Fez, uh, kind of an out there avant-garde uh, type literary magazine online. And after it was rejected, probably a couple of dozen times. Uh, and after that, I never looked back. Uh, I've written uh, mainly short stories. I've uh, just finished a second novel, which will be coming out uh, this June. Uh, the short story collection uh, that's featured for Ohioana uh, this year is called New Twists. And uh, you like that cover, it was de designed by my uh, very talented uh, niece, who's an art student in college. And it's a spinning top signifying the new twist. And the new twists are re really just uh, 
my twist, uh, modern twists on, on old themes. Uh, so these are stories about abiding truths like uh, generosity or love or loss or redemption or forgiveness, but set, set in a modern uh, way. And uh, so that's the collection. Uh, there are uh, 15 uh, longer stories, in fact, amongst the longest stories that I've ever written in there with five very short ones, flash fiction really pieces uh, sprinkled in. Uh, this, is, um, this is my fifth uh, book, uh, four short story collections now and one novel, a second novel coming out in June, as I mentioned, uh, and uh, a fifth short story collection coming out this August. Happy to be here. Oh, happy to have you and thank you for sharing. Gwen. Hi, I'm Gwen and uh, this is my book uh, Place Your Votes, my first book, and um, it's a short story collection set, it's um, told from the perspective of 10 different characters from the same fictional small town in Ohio, um, and I started uh, writing actually in poetry. I started, uh, I went to Ohio Wesleyan University, and I started with a poetry workshop there, and um, that was my senior year of college. And after that, I went into business like Don. Um, I moved up to Detroit and worked up there for a few years. And I moved to Los Angeles and worked there. And then I moved down to San Diego. And um, I had a point where um, after I got married, I had a decision point where, you know, I didn't really need, I was working in software at the time and I didn't really enjoy it. So I thought, well, um, you know, why don't I try something different? So um, I went back to poetry and it didn't really fit me anymore. Um, it was, I don't know, it was too, just didn't fit how I wanted to tell stories. So I took a, a short story class through UCLA Extension online actually. And then I did some classes through UCSD Extension. And then I decided, well, I kind of want to do a workshop again like I'd done in poetry. And I didn't, this was 2004, 2005. And I didn't really know where to go. So I thought, well, Iowa's a good school. <laughs> so I applied to the Iowa had like a three week intensive workshop. So I went to the, the Iowa Writers Workshop for three weeks. Um, and then, you know, after you go there, you kind of catch a bug for sure. So then I went to um, Tin House Writers Workshop. I, I, I started going to more workshops. Um, and I finally, I had a short story published in I believe 2007, um, called A Boy With Sense that's in this book. And that won the John Steinbeck Award for fiction. So um, after that, I kind of, I kept going. I went to graduate school. And so I took a pause and I also had three kids. So that took a pause. <laughs> so um, this is now my first book, even though I started, you know, really focusing on short stories and fiction back in 2005. Um, my first book came out in September of 2020. So, um, so it's been a journey, but um, I'm glad I'm here. Thank you. Wow, thank you all for sharing. Um, so one question I want to just put out there and anyone can jump in. We're, we're throwing out a lot of times short stories and flash fiction, those things. And so we don't want to take our readers knowledge for granted. So how about just someone explain to us what what constitutes a short story. How is that different from like a novella, for instance? Anyone want to take this question? I think well, it's yeah. short. This <laughs> is <laughs> <laughs> shorter than a novella. <laughs> yeah. I, they, a, a lot of uh, in writing, we talk about word count instead of page count. Um, I think it's because because word count varies per writer, you know, one writer can have, if you look at Franzen or David Foster Wallace, it'll be, I call it wall to wall, wall text, you know, and, and so um, I think short stories, they defined it by word count a lot of times, like maybe 8,000 words or less, maybe, maybe 10,000 these days. Um, uh, when you, when you submit stories, place, a lot of places don't even want anything over 5,000 words, which constitutes about 20 pages in, uh, and double space pages, so. I, I would say, you know, you have to, you know, one characteristic of a short story, and I know this is true of novels and novellas too, but you've really got to identify who the main character is from the very first page and what's the conflict or the challenge or the want 
uh, or the need that they're looking for oh, you know, from the first page. The reader needs to get a sense of, of what it is that they are trying to accomplish, achieve, obtain, get away from, whatever it is, depending on the genre story that you're writing. Because, you know, as, as Gwen said, you've got, in most cases, 5,000 words. And you think that's a lot of words, but that goes by quickly. Um, especially if you're used to writing poetry or novels or some other uh, uh, longer or shorter form of, of writing, it, it goes by quick. So you've got to you've got to engage the reader really from page one. You've got to identify who the main character is and kind of what the circumstances are that they're trying to you know, get away from, achieve, obtain, because you just don't have a whole lot of time to build that up for the reader. You've got to get right to it and, and start that that story arc structure that a lot of us are familiar with. You got to start climbing that mountain pretty early, really from page one. Um, if you're going to have a story that's going to keep a reader engaged all the way through. Thank you. Yeah, I would just, uh, just to build on what Elliot and uh, Gwen are saying, a couple of points. One would be, uh, and this builds on what Elliot was just saying, and that is to get to the action as quickly as you can, because it's the, that action that's going to, that plot that's really going to drive everything. Uh, so getting there, getting your reader hooked to be sure, but also just getting to that action and getting to the struggle, right? What's the trouble? What's that trouble? as quickly as possible. So you can really play with that and then ultimately resolve that, of course, uh, through the story. Uh, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is I think you really wanna develop a main character and maybe sometimes because the container is so small, that may be the only character you have. There are many stories that have just one character or just two characters. You're probably not gonna have much space, much time to develop beyond that. Likewise with plots and subplots, you're probably not gonna have an opportunity for subplots, if any. Uh, in, uh, in a short story. But that main character is really what you want to work on, I think, because uh, that's, the, that's the character, as, as Kurt Vonnegut would say, that you want people rooting for. So uh, and now Vonnegut would go on to say you, you need to almost kill that character, really, to get people to, to root for him. I'm not sure I'd go that far. But uh, you want that character to be somebody you care about as a reader, care dearly about as a reader. How do you do that? And so I think that's got to be a principal focus of short story writing. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add? One thing that comes to my mind is the dichotomy of content and form. And, you know, many, every art, every art form has a form. And when it comes to storytelling, I, if you think about it, the form of a TikTok video is different than the form of if you're going out to the cinema for the night or if you're going to the theater to see a performance of a live play. So as I've heard um, almost everyone so far say, and I even came into this preloaded with the idea of 5,000 words because from an editorial perspective, I've done some editing on a lunch ticket called uh, a, a literary journal called Lunch Ticket um, during my MFA. And anyone who, once you start to submit short stories around, you'll see it even if you haven't had the experience of working on a literary journal, there's usually a cutoff. And sometimes it seems um, almost uh, pointless, you know, 5,000 words. What, why do we have this word count? Well, oftentimes it's just because it's practical in a literary journal to be able to have a certain quantity of of pages, a different, a certain amount of writers per issue, and 5,000 words tends to be a good average. Of course, there will be some where I've, I've seen extraneous cutoffs such as 7,500 words, it's a novelette, up to 9,000 to 10,000 words, we start to enter, enter novella territory. Um, so there's, there's that form, but then you have to ask yourself, how, how does the content fit the form? How does the content of a TikTok video how are you going to have your arc within that video versus a three to five act structure in a play or a film, which you still may have a three to five act structure in a TikTok video. I don't know. I've never made one, but I think we start to see um, you will have a different type of resonance with a short form versus a long form, whereas in a longer piece, such as a novel or a feature film or something like that, I've heard it said that it starts to emulate um, human experience, whereas the short form, like a short story, 
emulates memory. So then we have, you know, memory because when we remember things and remember stories when we're telling them to other people, we're usually remembering a person, a time, a place, and we want to get the ball rolling and, and finish this ex exchange. And it's really just what's fresh in our memory versus the long form narrative where we really get to have human experience fleshed out and we get to sit with those characters. And as every, uh, Don was saying, um, you know, the conflict, the, the trouble, the thing that sticks, all that is still at play from page one or sentence one or what have you. It's just how, how quick can we take them, uh, the audience for a ride and in what form are we trying to do that in? Right. Thank you. So one of the things that, you know, aspiring writers, we hear them say, I want to write, but I don't have time. And so all of us who write, you know, one of those things we know is that you don't have time, you make the time. <laughs> so it, it, it's not about having time, it's carving out the time that you do have. And so this last year, 2020, we had a lot of time on our hands with everything <laughs> a little bit shut down. I want to know how did the shutdowns, the pandemic, how did that affect your writing processes at all? Um, did, did you notice that you had more time to write? Or did you find that you had less time to write? Because something about, you know, working at home, people think that you have more time for Zoom meetings than you actually have time for life meetings, which, you know, a meeting that outside of the pandemic probably would have taken 20 minutes takes an hour and 20 minutes on Zoom, right? <laughs> How did the pandemic uh, affect you all? Um, speaking from my own experience, it, it was, um, I've been working out of my home for decades now. I, I'm a full-time writer, I'm a copywriter by trade, that's how I make my living. And um, so there, you know, that part actually, there wasn't a big adjustment. You know, I still had work coming in. I've always worked out of my home. So that wasn't, it, it was more, it just in terms broadly of the, the impact of the pandemic, it was more when I had to go to the store, go to the bank, go to the post office, the element of fear. Okay, that that's really what kicked in, but um, working at home that, you know, that was like, okay, everybody else is having a hard time. And I'm like, this is what I've been doing like forever. But in going back to your, your original question about finding the time, I mean, um, because I've been writing not only professionally, meaning for people who paid me, but also doing my own writing, you know, and had kids in the meantime and had a second full-time job in the meantime, um, you, you, have to, you have to find when you are most creative, you know, fortunately, I'm a morning person. So that's my most creative. And then you give up, you have to give up something. Everything comes at a price. So that is why I get up at four o'clock in the morning so that I can put in X number of hours on my own writing, whether it's on a novel, whether it's on a short story, whatever. So that by the time nine o'clock rolls around, I'm now working on client projects. I'm working on income stuff. It's, it's discipline. Um, I used to work for the newspaper years and years and years ago. And um, there was no such thing as writer's block. There was no such thing as, oh, I can't turn in the story because I just didn't feel it, right? Because they would feel you right out the door. I mean, um, so you learned to not let that get in the way. You learn to be very disciplined. You learn to, you learn to always have some part of your mind working on your own projects, even when you're working on other stuff. So that it, it's like there's a little second little motor humming in the back, so that when you sat down to work on that particular project, you can now shift the motor up to a higher speed and get right into it, 
you know, I mean, yes, it's lovely to say, well, you know, I have to have the right light and the right music and the right pencil or the right whatever. Yeah, ain't that precious. Okay, um, you know, I've had to write in hospital rooms. I've had to write on in airplane terminals. I've had to write, at one time I had to write sitting in a hotel bathroom because that was the only working outlet. Um, you know, don't be so precious about, oh, I have to have, everything has to be perfect because it's not going to be perfect. And if it's something you want to do, then stop looking for excuses and just say, I'm going to do it. And if that means I can't do something else, well, either be willing to give up something else or maybe you just don't really want to write. You know, I mean, that's, I don't, I don't mean to sound harsh, but I've been at this a really long time. You know, it's, it's sacrifice. You make a sacrifice, you make a choice. Thank you, thank you. That's, <laughs> that's beautiful, you know. Um, it's the truth, tough love, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, someone else I thought I, was going to speak. Go ahead, Gwen. Sorry, right, I was going to say, I, I kind of, I make mine a routine, my writing. You know, I have to do the same thing. Um, and I don't write every day because, you know, like I said, I have three kids, so um, we had Zoom school. So my routine definitely changed um, throughout it. And I found actually during the pandemic, I needed some comic relief and I write in multiple genres. So I um, had started like a comedy screenplay writing that. So I really turned to that just, just to get a break from kind of the heaviness of 2020. Um, so I, and screenplays are a little bit, you know, you're not, you don't have to just you know, focus solely on the pros and, you know, you can kind of zoom through them and then, you know, go back and fix and fix. And so, um, so I found myself kind of moving into a different genre just to give my brain a break. But um, I always tell people, you know, people say, oh, I, I, I can't write, I could never write. And, and I said, well, it's just like a muscle that you work out, you know, you have to, you have to practice every single day and you wouldn't, you know, say, oh, I'm going to run a marathon and just decide you're going to run 26 miles one day. You know, you have to train for it. So um, that's how I, I see it. You have to just practice it. And, and, you know, even on the days that I don't write, I'm still thinking about it, but um, it's something you should just, you know, have in the back of your mind or, or make it, make a routine and a practice out of. Yes. Uh, Gwen, I, I agree that writing is something that you have to practice. I tell people all the time that unlike any other gift, anyone can, can learn to write. Like, you know, everybody can't learn the same. I don't care how many classes you take. If you don't have a pretty voice, it's not going to come out beautiful. But if you practice that discipline of writing, you can get better. Um, so thank you for sharing. Does anyone else have any comments that you want to add about how the pandemic has affected your writing process or anything? Well, I would, I would just add that, you know, in addition to, uh, and a number of people have said this, having more time, right? And, and writing takes a concentrated amount of time. Certainly that was the case this past year or so. Beyond that, though, uh, in terms of and this is me personally, why I write, why I write. I write for the same reason that great writing affects me. I like to, to think more deeply as a result of a written piece. I, need to, I like to, to feel more deeply as a result of, of something that, that, that I'm reading. And so that's what I strive to do when I'm writing. And as we experience this past year, it, it's been a difficult year, a most difficult year. Um, challenging with the pandemic for sure the economic uh, upheaval and the uncertainty that that has brought. And uh, of course, the social justice uh, protests and unrest that we're living through even now. Uh, this, this is a difficult time, the presidential campaign thrown in there. Uh, and so what I found is um, I, I was tapping into that. I was tapping into that more in my writing. I, I found myself writing both a novel and a series of short stories along the way, kind of on two tracks, two parallel tracks, one helping the other. But in both cases, I uh, felt that I had more, I don't know, more subjects to work with, more subjects, more topics, uh, more depth, or even angst, you know, uh, surrounding me, surrounding us every day. And I found that a driver uh, for me in my writing. And I think, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that this year was a year where I felt deepened in my writing. So I felt the pandemic affect me that way. 
Nathan or Elliot, did you have anything to add? I would just say we were all in survival mode last year. Some of us weren't able to hold on to our jobs, you know? So I always say I'm, I'm the type of person that puts a lot of pressure on myself to produce things, to work hard. And I don't know if that's um, something everybody goes through, but I had to tell myself, myself to just take a chill pill. There's a lot going on in the world. And I do like without everything that happened last year, I do think that there is something to say for writing every day to have the discipline, to have the self-control. But when there's all these things going on, in, you know, in, in our world with the people around us, it was hard to stay focused and to, it, it just felt so selfish almost this um, hobby. Hey, I'm gonna go work on my writing. I knew that I had my book coming out in October so I had, I'm sure a lot of people, well, we, we're all recent, you know, have, have a book out recently. And for me, I kept saying, is this, is it even going to get published now? What's going to happen? It, and there's that selfish feeling of, I can't go do readings. I can't do this. I felt so just selfish, even promoting it. But then I started to kind of get over the hill on that. And I just said, well, you know what? this can still be my escape. This can still be a refuge for me. Literature is, writing is, it can be a catharsis, but I just sometimes used it as an escape from the seriousness of everything that was happening, happening around us. Um, but without all of that, I think it's important for any writer to just know, I do, I will always testi testify that writing every day, nothing will, will beat that, but you have to be aware enough to say, where am I at as a writer in my writing life? Have I just started out on this? Well, then don't put the pressure on yourself to finish that novel. Maybe just write, just get in the habit, explore, exploratory work. Or are you a novel, a novelist who has a book or two under your belt? Well, then be aware enough to say, all right, well, today or the next few months, I'm working on that third draft of this piece. So, or maybe you're generating new content or new work um, and say, okay, well today, know yourself and your life enough to say, well, you know what? I have an hour that I could set aside to just sit here and just type. I'll just put on some music and just feel these characters and see where they take me. But then as you learn more about the craft and the discipline and the form, whether it's a short story or a novel, you'll start to see, okay, this piece has taken shape. It's kind of, it's starting to crystallize. And as long as you commit to your work and whether it's a, a new draft, you're finishing something up or even just reading, learning to read literature, I think can be a creative exercise for any person who wants to really start writing. And I would even say, you know, education is great and all that, go into a graduate program, that's great. But if you don't have the discipline then I don't know how far it will really take you. You have to love literature and want to absorb it and study it so that you can produce it and know what you're producing. Then the habits and the discipline starts to come back. I, I would just simply say, um, you know, one of the things I learned within the last year is how little control I have personally as to what goes on around me. <laughs> Big picture, you know, um, I kind of always knew that, but, but you know, the, the, the whole pandemic really made you realize how little control you have over what's going on around you. There's certain things you can control, but big picture you can't control. But um, you know, like Nancy, I, you know, I worked in journalism. Well, I teach uh, English at Ole Miss now, but I worked in journalism for a long time, but like Nancy, and I'm used to deadlines. And um, to that end, I got a lot of writing done uh, this past year because and, and like Nathan and, and Gwen have said, and Don too, that, that was kind of my escape. Uh, I turned off the television. I quit watching the news, which is hard for me to do as an old journalist because I'm a news junkie. But I turned off the news. I went in and wrote, and that was my escape. Um, I felt like, you know, I can't control necessarily what goes on out there, but I can control what goes on, you know, in, in the four walls. And I had to work from home and, and make those adjustments too. But um, I have to write every day, uh, at least five days a week in order to, to – to progress, to get things done. 
I have to set myself deadlines. Uh, sometimes my publisher and my agent sends, sends, sends me deadlines or sets deadlines for me. I have to some, sometimes set my own arbitrary deadlines, but I write every day to make progress. Some days I, I wrote last year, I got five words, you know, in an hour and a half or two hours. Some days I got 500 words in an hour and a half to two hours. But even on those days when I only got five words, I was making progress. And, and to kind of what Nathan said about sometimes you just got to carve out an hour put the headphones on, sit down at the keyboard and start, start, you know, typing away to see what, what happens. That's how you're going to make progress. And Nancy touched on it really well. It, if you wait for the right moment, if you wait for the muse to kind of sit down on your shoulder and say, okay, we can begin, but there's always going to be laundry to do. There's always going to be dogs to walk. There's always going to be bills to pay. You know, there's never a perfect moment. So, so you have to decide, I think, um, you, you know, when am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? Where am I going to do it? And, um, this year with the pandemic helped me kind of realize where writing was in terms of a priority in my life. Um, and like Don, I write as a, as a part of expression. It's just a part of who I am. I could never envision myself not writing, even if I never got anything else published. And so um, I was able to really take advantage of, 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 of the time over the last year. But um, one of the best things I found was just turn off the news, go in. I, I couldn't control what was out there, but I could control what I was writing. I could control those characters. I could control what was going on in my stories and my novels. And uh, that was comforting to me um, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, well, thank you all for sharing. Um, another question I have is, you know, one of the things that I, I heard um, as you all were speaking is that everyone has a different process. Now we all have the same 24 hours in a day, how we utilize them is up to us. And everyone has a different process. So does anyone have any unique or quirky writing habits that you would like to share? I know we have the writing every day, writing with music sometimes. Um, I like to write with no socks on. No, no socks on, okay. For, for whatever reason, something about my bare feet helps me, helps me write better. <laughs> I like that. Anything else? You well, know, I'll, mention, I'll mention a few, a few things. I don't know how quirky they are, but just uh, part of my habit, if you will. Uh, and uh, some are probably obvious and maybe some less, less obvious. Um, when I am writing a short story, unlike a novel, for example, or some long form writing, I jump into it and I, uh, I immediately get a draft down as quickly as possible when I focus on one thing and one thing only, and that's the plot. So I don't worry about description. I don't worry about um, you know, how I'm developing the characters all that much. Um, I don't worry about grammar. I don't worry about uh, describing things all that well. I just worry about the plot. And that's what I focus on initially. And I can do that probably in a day or maybe a couple of days. Um, and then after that is where the real work begins, right? So after that is really where I spend the bulk of my time, which is on, on the development of the characters, on the embellishment of the story, on the refinement of the story, on the removal of stuff uh, in some cases, uh, and ultimately kind of polish the story up. And that's really kind of where I focus and spend the bulk of my time. And that may not be so unusual. Sometimes what I do when I begin a story is I begin by writing the first line and the last line. Mm -hmm. And what I do then is I kind of put them together. <laughs> so I develop that story arc with that last line in mind. And, and honestly, very often that last line kind of remains about the same when I'm finished with the story. So I begin with that end in mind. And the third thing I would mention, this is just me, is... Um, you know, writing, you're in your head, right? It's, it's intellectual work, it's, it's mind work. And uh, all my life, I've never been able to really do that too long. I've never was able to sit at a desk too long, for example, even though I did a lot of desk work. Uh, so I run every day. Uh, and uh, it's the running and the writing that for me uh, has a certain rhythm to it. And so I think about story ideas and I think about even the way I phrase things when I'm running. Uh, and running is a very therapeutic exercise for me. It's even a spiritual exercise for me. Uh, I think uh, one goes with the other. So if I were just a runner, I don't think that would be, I would be complete. If I were just a writer, I don't think I'd be complete. Um, you know, writing is about expressing our lives, right? The, the world around us and the world within us. And so uh, 
for me, running and exercise is an important part of the writing process, if you will. It makes me a better writer. I was going to say along those lines, when I get stuck, um, I, I'm a baker, so <laughs> I like to bake. So I think it, it, there's something about like using your hands or moving your body or whatever that gets your mind moving as well. So um, I agree. That's, that's not a quirk, but sometimes when I get stuck, I bake. That would be dangerous for me, Gwen, because <laughs> I'm also an emotional eater. So <laughs> trust me, it's been tough during the pandemic. I, I really like to bake. So I, I, had, to, I had to calm that down after a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Are there any other answers? Okay. Well, uh, some of you have been writing for quite a while. Um, I believe all of you have been in, been at this for at least five, 10 years or, or more. So um, are there any processes of your um, writing that has changed from the beginning when you started until now? Do you notice that you do things differently than you did before or have you just been consistent? Gwen, have you always been baking? <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, yeah, actually I had a point in my life where I was trying to decide whether I wanted to be a writer or a baker. Um, so looks like I chose writing, but, um, every once in a while when things are not going well, I just say, oh, maybe I should just quit and start a bakery. But, um, for me, what changed, um, from, from when I started to now is that when I started, I would go through a lot of drafts and sometimes I would write a first draft and I would only take maybe a character into the second draft or, or a sentence. Um, and I would go through, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 revisions on a story. But now I kind of do, you know, maybe three, maybe four uh, revisions or versions. And then I feel like, okay, this is kind of good, good to go. Um, obviously not, not with an editor at that. I mean, at that point I could go to an editor, but from my end, um, I've definitely um, cut down on the number of vision, versions and revisions that I do. I'll mention the difference in my own experience as a writer uh, these past few years. Um, you know, we think about writing as, as a creative process, it certainly is, uh, but it's not just about you know, putting your feet up or having the headphones on and, and typing things out. It's not just about that. There's a whole other part of the writing process, which none of us really likes very much and none of us even likes to talk about all that much. And that is the bis what I'll call the business end of writing. And uh, it's about getting your work out there, as you said, uh, Elliot, getting stuff on submittable and keeping it out there and so forth. And when you get to a point of trying to get published, of course, that's where the real hard work begins, where you've got to query um, publishers, they all have their own standards, their own submission guidelines, all of that stuff. It takes forever. And uh, I'd love to have an agent. In fact, that's one of my goals, uh, kind of near to medium term is to get an agent uh, to do more of that work that, that I don't like to do myself. Uh, but having said that, I think um, having done a ton of that work now, having five books and soon seven books published, um, I've learned a lot in the process that I wouldn't have otherwise known. When we were in New Harmony, the workshop, I remember um, we had these um, craft lectures that they called them, one hour lectures every day on various topics. Uh, and this one had to, uh, had to do with uh, getting published. I'm so glad I went because it was like a black hole for me. I wouldn't have known otherwise which way to turn. Um, and uh, our, our instructor, all of the instructors were faculty members or writers themselves or both, um, started the session by saying, um, who here likes this work, you know, likes doing this work, querying editors and getting published and nobody, no hands went up. And he said, you know, do you think, does any of us think that we would have ever heard of Emily Dickinson, for example, uh, if she didn't care some about that part of the writing process? So, and she did, she worked closely with, with her publisher and so, and with editors and probably winced when they edited her, her poems, I, I imagine. Uh, it's an important part of the writing process. And I think we're not a complete writer. And I think I'm a more complete writer now that I've 
begun to master that, that end of the process. I don't like it. It's thankless work. It's, it's very unglamorous, very tedious, very time consuming. But I think it is an important part of being a writer. And I've, I've really uh, done much more work in that area over the past few years than I did initially. And then there's the whole marketing part. Yes. I mean, yes. It, it's not even marketing after the project comes out, which I don't care how you publish, you still got to do it. It's that whole platform building thing that you're supposed to be building your platform before you have even really had anything published because nobody wants to publish somebody without a platform. Talk about a catch 22. But and it's changed so much. I mean, my first book came out in 2004 and you know, websites were just in their infancy. I, I'm not even sure if we had social media then, but if you did, it was not like it is now. And you know, of, of all the components of a writer's life, you know, I, I'll, I'll even give up looking for an agent if I could just find somebody to handle the social media and the marketing because I don't necessarily enjoy it. And, and, and it's just like, oh my God, I've got to spend another hour doing this when I'd rather be writing. But yeah, that is something I think a lot of people who are just getting into it don't realize, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see it on social media. I want to get an, an agent so that I don't have to worry about um, getting my work published and, and I, I want to be traditionally published so that I don't have to worry about the marketing. It's like, yeah, good luck. You know, I mean, it is, it's, it's kind of like, I want to have a baby, but can somebody else deal with the diapers and the three o'clock feedings? Yeah. Okay. That ain't happening. So, um, yeah, it is, it is, um, it's just a, it's a much broader, uh, list of, of duties for writers than I think it was years ago. I mean, years ago, you did the writing and somebody else did the marketing for you. And it, it's just not like that anymore. Uh, just to piggyback on what Nancy and Don said, the, the Washington Post did a story, I believe it was back in 2017, on the kind of the, the resurgence of independent bookstores. This was following on the heels of Kindle and eBooks and Barnes and Noble had their nook and all of this. Um, and and I, I use this statistic all the time. In that year alone, there were 746,000 books that were published in 2017, according to them. Now, that's traditionally published, self-published hybrid published, university presses, everything that's out there. So if you wrote a book in 2017, you were one of 745,999 other books that were trying to get the attention of readers and trying to find a, a space and a place. And, um, you know, Nancy and Donna, right, you, you, that's a whole other side of the writing. You think when you've written the book and the book's uh, finished or the book's been published that you, know, you just kind of wipe your hands and, and go away but the real work begins after that um, because it is about marketing it is about you know developing your platform and and I'll just say one thing on that and we could probably have a whole nother panel session just on kind of the business side of writing if you are a writer you've got work out there you're struggling to find places that will carry your book outside of social media look for places that you can be the only person selling books so those are the places like gift shops those are places like state park gift shops. If you have state parks in your in your state, Ohio's got wonderful state parks that have gift shops. Um, places that sell homemade goods, you know, cook cookies and, and, and brownies and, and, and incense and things like that. Places where, where you've got a connection or you've got a relationship or a footprint. Uh, those folks oftentimes are, are willing to, to carry your book, you know, and you have to work out the terms with those folks. But you'll be amazed at how many books you will sell because you're the only person there selling books. You know, if your book sits on the shelf at Barnes and Noble in Easton in Columbus, you're one of, I don't know, I don't know how many, there's two floors of, two full floors of books in that store. You're one of however many books are in that store. But if you're at a state park and uh, during the summertime and there's people coming into vacation state to state parks and a, a reader says, I left my book at home, I need something to read. And they go to the gift shop and you're one of the few authors that are there you're likely to pick up, they're likely to pick up, uh, pick up your book. So um, that would just be my, my, my little tidbit about that. Uh, you know, look for places as authors, uh, look for places where you can, you can, you can 
have your work displayed where you're not competing necessarily with thousands and thousands of other books and authors, um, because that gives you an opportunity to have your work noticed. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, I really appreciate all of your comments, and I wish we had much more time to talk. Nancy, I do have to say that I was cracking up at your social media voice. Um, <laughs> you, you toned it down a little bit, but it was going someplace where I was just screaming, laughing inside. In the five minutes we have left, um, can you let the readers know where they can find more about you and um, your works? And thank you all for being here. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure. It, it really has. So thank you all. So we'll just start if you can limit it to about 45 seconds each. Um, just quickly let everyone know where they can find you. And we will start with Nancy. Okay, um, the best place to go is my website and it's nancychristie.com, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-E. Everything is there, links to the podcast, information about my books, more than what you want to know, but everything is there. That's the central location and from there you can check everything else out. All right, Elliot, how can they find you? Kind of like Nancy, easiest way to find me is on my website, elliotparker.com. That, that's one L one T. Uh, my mom gave me one L and one T because she wanted to be wanted me to be unique. A little bit, you know, <laughs> how that would all turn out <laughs> in terms of my uniqueness. But it's uh, elliotparker.com, uh, and I have uh, links to all my books, uh, places where you can find my books if you live in certain states, uh, independent bookstores and and chain bookstores where you can find books. Uh, my contact info, contact page is there. Social media links. All of that is there. So that's the best place to go. And uh, I'd love to hear from, from, from writers and readers alike. So feel free, even if you don't want to read anything I've written and you just want to talk about writing, look me up. I'm, I'm happy to talk about writing anytime or marketing. All righty. Uh, Nathan? The best place is my website, nathan-elias.com. You can find the reincarnations there or at the montagpress.com website. My novel is coming out later this summer. It's called Coil Quake Rift. Look out for that. You can also follow me on Instagram or Twitter. It's at underscore Nathan Elias. Don? Same with me, my website, which is dontessone.com. Not terribly original, uh, but uh, there you'd find links to all, all of my books, including the upcoming books this summer. Uh, I also sprinkle in a collection of short stories that have been published uh, in literary magazines that aren't in my short story collections just yet to give people something a little extra. And like uh, Elliot said, I very much invite uh, interaction with anybody who might have a question, other authors, and there's some contact information uh, on the site as well. And Gwen. Again, uh, like everyone else, I have a website, gwengoodkin.com, G-O-O-D-K-I-N, not, not W-I-N. Um, and there's links there. Um, I have a, a page for my book, A Place Remote. Um, there is a, a bookstore in Toledo called Gathering Volumes that has some uh, copies of my book um, that I sent them book plates uh, to. So um, I don't, I, I'm, I don't know if they have more copies. I sent them 10. So um, I don't know how many are left, but maybe 10. But uh, <laughs> uh, they have book plate signed copies at that bookstore. Well, thank you all so very much. It has definitely been a pleasure to spend this time with you. And for the audience, thank you for joining. Uh, to learn more about Ohioana, please make sure you visit ohioana.org. So thank you. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.